everything was going really well today. Like if you, the, the vibe in Philadelphia has been wonderful because it's warm weather and there's people out on the streets and uh, it feels really nice for me to be able to introduce Mason Carter to you. And I just want to tell you a little bit of a, a story about how I first met Mason. Um, we were kind of, um, if you ever read Cat's Cradle by Kurt Vonnegut, we were kind of in a carass, I think. Uh, there was a Philly Free Streets event. Mason, you'll probably remember this a couple yes, of years of ago. <laughs> and um, I was playing a, uh, an old Philly street game called Dead Box with chalking on the sidewalk. And Mason and his girlfriend Olivia stopped by and started playing Dead Box. And they were curious enough to try and learn about it. And perhaps a year or two later, uh, when I started seeing Mason's work on Instagram, I was fascinated by it because I've always been interested in what you might call visionary or outsider or folk art. It's a lot of, a lot of labels for these things, but I didn't quite understand Mason's work. And I understand it a bit better now, but there's a lot of mystery to it uh, still. And uh, I see Mason as a, a self-taught, primarily self-taught artist, but uh, he's also, you might say, a self-taught urban planner or futurist too. And he's going to tell us about uh, the city that he's created, which is called Blendini. So what, I, what I'd like to do is introduce you to Mason. And then just initially, I'd like Mason to just hold up some of the photos without a lot of description, but just to give you an idea of what fascinating trippy, psychedelic, and interesting, not photos, I mean drawings, the, these are. So Mason, if you could just hold some of those up in front of the, oh, yes. the camera and people get a sense of what we're going to be looking at. Today. Oh yeah, so um, you know, a few of them that I wanted to show were of yep. uh, the most recent Blendini land grabs that I've done. And mm -hmm. so for anyone that you know doesn't know, the Blendini land grab is um, where I actually have plots of land that I'm selling within Blendini. I'll do this in like uh, batches. So there might be eight plots that are available at once. Yeah. And then uh, I'll, uh, and then, you know, I'll be selling those for a limited time. The price per plot goes up each time. And then I draw a building for somebody. So, right. um, so I, we'll get into the land grabs. I just want people to get a sense of just what these things look like. Just, yeah. so just pure. So this is or, or, example, art without really understanding them, but and, just seeing some of the imagery. And then we'll be we'll begin to go into them and, and try and explain them and understand them. How about one more? Show us one more, please. Okay, they're really wonderful, strange, and unusual kinds of images. And Excellent. The, um, the initial question that comes to mind is, tell us a little bit about how Blendini started. How did you come up with this idea? And how did you start doing artwork in general and this artwork yeah. in particular? I mean, the idea came pretty gradually. And, and it's really this uh, converging of different influences in my life. Mm -hmm. uh, a big thing was uh, going to the Fleischer Art Memorial and uh, taking classes there, including a very influential class of mine that I took called Observation, Memory, and Imagination. Yes. And that, you know, unlocked a lot in me of bringing my imagination back into the art world that had lied dormant for a long time. Um, and then um, as a, uh, you know, as a kid, I was very interested in drawing cities and doodling and all that. Um, but um, it was the imagination class that brought that passion slowly back to the forefront. And then uh, living in Philadelphia and, you know, really kind of growing as a person with these buildings, um, I really developed a bond with, with a lot of the buildings here in the city. Uh -huh. And it's very upsetting to see the buildings that have gotten demolished here. Well, these buildings, you know, we treat them, we throw them in the trash as though they're, you know, nothing. And I thought to myself, what if these buildings have feelings too? That along with my doodling monsters initially, and then that ended up uh, becoming buildings. And then with that uh, became, uh, became Blendini over time. Uh -huh. 
Um, were you doing art as a child? Yeah. So I actually, I honestly forgot about a lot of the art that I did as a child. Uh -huh. And it was something that I um, recently uncovered. I, I uncovered a lot of childhood memories of yeah. this art that I did, uh, including I drew a, I drew cities, you know, specifically they, it's interesting to see that city verse. And I, I wish I brought, brought that, but uh -huh, the initial uh, one, yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. And it's it's so interesting to see my thoughts of cities back then and my interests back then versus yeah. my interests now. And so they're totally different. Sure. Yet there's still it's still cool to see the connection. But you've never took, as I understand it, you never really took art courses until the the course that you took at Fleischer. Which yeah, was, I'm totally. Was it, would you call that a, an an art course or it was a course in imagination? So that was a course in imagination, but. You know, at Fleischer, as a member, you can take a lot of free classes that are of many different subjects. So mm -hmm. um, in addition to that imagination class, because you can take you can take up to two courses a semester. So yeah. um, I was taking imagination and I was taking intro to 2D design at the same time. Right. So that was really helpful because I could you I could do the imagination where I was just doing such free form abstract stuff. And then, but then I had the 2D design class that could teach me more of yeah. the, the technical skills for uh, the kind of work that I do now. And this was about how long ago? Uh, this was, um, let's see. So I started Blendini um, in like late summer 2018. Uh -huh. And before that, I was going to the, okay, so the Fleischer, Fall 2017 was when I yeah. had my first experience with the Fleischer and that and fall of 2017 into that into that winter of 2018 yeah. was really where I was was taking imagination for the first time. Yeah. And yeah. I was going I was going wild with the with all the possibilities. Well, and, I was wondering about that, what that was like for you emotionally to be taking that course and how that felt when you say you were going wild. Can you say more about that? Yeah, so I think taking this taking the course where you're really encouraged to, you learn this methodology where you kind of start through just scribbling and there's a lot more to it, but you know, that that's for a whole other video. Uh -huh. um, but, um, but it got me into scribbling and I just started it with charcoal and then that, uh, that eventually got into pastels and doing, and then I just fell in love with the op, the uh, the process of using all different kinds of materials. Like I was using acrylic paints, yeah. and uh, the and the class was really good because it would teach you these methodologies for accessing your imagination. But then it was mostly a free form design lab. So yeah, um, and all the other students were doing unique things. So you just go. Um, you know, with that built in encouragement. So, you know, I'm taking this class, I have a very like encouraging fellow student body, very encouraging teacher. And then at home, I'm just like, I'm not doing art for the, the outcome of like, oh, I'm going to create this piece that people are, I hope people love. Yeah, I really didn't care about that. I was just doing the art for the sake of the art. And that was something that um, had been alien to me for a long time. So yeah. that was very exciting to just do something for the sake of doing it and ex the sake of like exploring the mind. Yeah. You know, I, I'm, I keep thinking about the word wild, you know, going wild because when you start with charcoals and you start with the uh, 2D printing and, and these different techniques and you end up with Blendini, which is such a wild, uh, sense of neighborhoods and, and images of buildings and w wild environments that you're that you're constructing. Maybe you can hold one of these up again. And what's interesting is to go from these images as art to the images as having meaning, having yeah. feelings, having ideas, having. Yeah. Um, concepts that relate to urban planning yep. that, re that relate to yeah. um the the structures that we build and the structures that we tear down so why don't you just pick out one of your yep. so uh, one of yeah, your paintings I'll show, I'll and show tell moon, us the story about it so i'll show moon row this is moon row okay. yeah so this is moon row and 
this neighborhood is special because um, the, the people that inhabit the neighborhood as well as the buildings have a very strong reverence for the moon uh -huh. and, and the stars in general. And so something that, um, so something that this neighborhood really tries to achieve is when it comes to its street lighting as well as the lighting of the buildings that it's very friendly to the night sky. And so, you know, you can ideally look up and see a lot more stars in a city than you'd expect yeah. uh, living in Monroe. Uh, there's an observatory in Monroe, so people can kind of just come and observe the stars. And then they also have uh, starry, starry nights where the buildings will go to sleep for a period of time. Uh -huh. And so all the lights go out. And so you just have this like pitch perfect dark sky. To, so to so the buildings out. are, you could say, anthropomorphic. They're, they're like human beings. They're, yes. They have human qualities. Yep. Maybe you could show the image again and point out some of the specifics. You know, there, there are eyes, there are, I don't know if there are people sleeping there, but uh, talk about some of the things that are characteristic of that environment and and perhaps point to them so that the viewers can oh yeah so can, can see what's happening in, in this neighborhood yeah so in in here specifically i mean if you look to um the right and you see this building that's it says uh it's an apartment building but it's also emblazoned the sign on here. itself that says moon give me if strength. you like I'll, I'll hold it for you and you you can point at it yeah and you can point things so out. it says moon give me strength and so th this one specifically is like you know, looking up to the, the sky, it's yearning for something more than it has um, on the earth. But um, in that in that case, the idea of uh, this, you know, being in the stars and the heavens and space travel um, just really intrigues the hell out of this building. Uh -huh. um, and so, yeah, I mean, in this one specifically, you can see, um, let's see, the Man Full of Trouble uh, Tavern there, which is a uh, you know, named after an old Philly tavern um, from the revolutionary days. Uh -huh. And uh, so th this guy specifically is very uh, sneaky. He's, he's, he's actually full of trouble. Uh -huh. um, and so you can see from his expression that, you know, he's, he's thinking something unsavory right now. I don't know right. what it is, but so some of these, build these buildings have all kinds of personalities. Oh, yeah. They, they could be what we might call positive or very negative personalities. Too. Oh yeah, definitely. Okay. Yeah, some are quite negative. There's uh -huh. a building in Blondini that literally hates humans. Okay. And will treat, will basically be like a haunted house if you go try to go into it as a human. Yeah, so as you start layering and constructing this neighborhood, this Moonrow neighborhood, um, is there an overall design that you start out with or does it just kind of happen Tell, tell us about the process of how yeah. these buildings get added one one after the other. Yeah, to so the design. so I'll actually show. Um, so this one specifically here, um, and I'll I'll show this one because this is the most recent. Okay. This is the most recent one. If you need I me did. to hold it, let me know. That would um, make it easier. And um, so for for this specifically. Um, I, I improvise um, where I just kind of get a feeling of like uh, what I, I want. I want to hold this up while you're talking about it. Yeah, I get uh -huh. a feeling of like what I want the neighborhood to be, kind okay. of like maybe what some of the amenities are, the types of places. And um, I, um, and I, and I also try to think about um, sort of the buildings and the overall scene that I might want. But the buildings themselves, there's, there's not, there's a lot of subconscious planning going on, but uh -huh. I don't like, I don't take a pencil and just like do a like a rough draft of a building or something. I just go with the pen and we'll, we'll go to town and just figure out the shapes and all that as I go along. And I'll just, maybe I'll just draw like a random shape just to get started. Uh -huh. And because Not I have, what that shape no, is because I have into. no, because I have no like specific goal in mind. Like I want, I want the building to like have some sort of essence to it, or I've decided maybe I want my building to be like dominantly brick. So like, you know, you can see with like fruit uh, clothiers right here, I knew in my mind that I wanted that to be a brick building, but that was it. And then, you know, I knew that I wanted it to have some flourishes to it. 
Um, but you know, that was it. Uh -huh. And so I am, a, and so occasionally what I've been doing now is that I'll actually, before I start coloring everything in, I'll draw, like I'll draw the, um, basically like this, the outlines of the buildings without the details in it so mm -hmm. that I can plan um, like how many buildings are gonna be in the scene. Yeah. Um, but then other times the way I've done it is where I'll draw just one building at a time to completion. So I'll just, I'll do this from like zero to a hundred and then I'll go to the next one. Okay. With this in particular, I actually, I drew out the outlines first and then I did all the, the inner outlining and then I did the coloring. Okay, so let's take one of the buildings. You mentioned Fruit Clothiers. Yeah, so Fruit and, Clothiers is right here. Yeah, and um, why Fruit Clothiers? How did that come to you? So the Clothiers specifically, I think because of Philly history, I've, you know, there, there were a lot of uh, Clothiers and um, I, uh, sometimes the, I, it'll just pop at me. Uh -huh. um, I knew I wanted the neighborhood to be Fruit. And the reason why there was a fruit um, and why, why this specifically became fruit is because on the Blendini map that I did, I drew fruit in a certain spot that was close to the mountains. So I was like, once I drew the mountains, I knew it was going to be fruit. Okay. But, so I think what you're touching on is a, a bigger issue about the construction of this overall city. Um, maybe you could say a little bit about the layout of the city, the types of neighborhoods how they're joined together, yeah. um, how they vary one, yep. one from the next. In other words, you might look at a city like Seattle or Philadelphia or San Francisco, and they all have different characteristics. How would you describe the characteristics of Blendini in terms of its layout? Yeah, so I think one thing with Blendini is that, you know, the typical idea that we have for a city layout is that most of the actions downtown mm -hmm. and then all of the life revolves around like one central spot. Um, in Blendini, that concept isn't as, uh, isn't as much there. You yeah. know, there is a Blendini central. It, it's certainly Blendini central. It's certainly on, um, it's certainly there, it's, cer it's certainly there, but uh -huh. uh, there are other neighborhoods like Fruk, for example, actually is a pretty dense neighborhood, but it looks, you see on the map that it's like more out, but it's because there are multiple population centers that are around. It's the population centers are much more distributed. So you'll actually have more like five or six downtowns, so to speak, uh, in different parts of the city. And, and is that accidental or is there a plan to that? In other words, when you think about planning a city or building an ideal city, yeah. is that something that you have in mind that it's better to have a city that's got 60 centralized areas than to have one yeah. central downtown? Yeah, or think, it just comes to you that way? I think in general, well, Blondini overall has been something that has been a, a gradual thing where I start to think more and more about it like as it's going along. And it's just because as I'm, as I'm doing it, I know more about it. Um, I was also telling you before the, uh, um, before we started talking that I have something called a time phone. Uh -huh. uh, this is the time phone for, uh, for people watching. And uh, basically this time phone, and you know, you pick it up like this, you just, uh, you just dial the numbers. Um, I won't say what the number is, but, uh, the uh, but I actually talked to my future self, who's currently the mayor of the city. The mayor I'm laughing behind my mask, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sure. The, so I talked to my future self. So he so currently all of these drawings that you see take place in the year tw twenty one forty. And I should interject and say that's very helpful because we didn't really present the notion to start off with that Blendini is a future. It is a city. future city Absolutely. where all so the that's buildings good to are established. Alive. Yes. Okay. So. Um, and the city was founded in 2073. So you can get a sense that, you know, this, this is a, this is over the course of uh, 67 years that the, that the city is even, and so, you know, it's remarkable growth what the city has had in 67 uh -huh. years. Right. But um, 
something is like when I did my first neighborhood versus now, I know a lot more about the city now because I'm talking to my future self on the phone all the time. I mean, right. time phone calls are expensive, but I do it a lot. And he doesn't want to tell me like, he can't tell me everything because then that might affect the plan when it comes to starting, getting the city started and like, you know, creating some kind of hole in the space time. Continuum. Your future self cannot, cannot tell you. He can't tell me much too much. Detail. He can tell, he, and also it's difficult to just tell over the phone. So, you know, a lot of these drawings are, um, you know, first and foremost, they're interpretations that uh -huh. I have by talking to my future self on the phone. Yeah, but my understanding is that the, um, the, your imagination as it goes into the drawings and as it goes into the specifics, the neighborhoods and so on, um, doesn't end with the drawing. Because when I've asked you questions about, I was asking you about a river once and um, you said, oh, well, that river is a tributary of some other, um, some other lake perhaps. And um, I said, well, had you already thought of that lake? And you said, no, I just made it up at this point. Oh yeah, Smiggles Creek. Smiggles, yes. Yeah, we we're talking exactly. about Smiggles Creek. So if I was gonna ask you about that clothier and who were this, the founder of the clothier, you may have not thought of who the founder was previously, but I assume that you'd be able yep. to just improvise that right now. Yeah, and so I would improvise that. And so mm -hmm. um, that's actually good because if I'm improvising it, then I got to tell my future self what I did because, okay. you know, then it's got to happen in the future. But um, yeah, you know, Blondini, it, it's the whole thing is very improvised. Uh -huh. I don't, and I think that's kind of something where I didn't do anything at the scale of this before in my life because mm -hmm. I used to, and I still, I, I overthink a lot of things, but I don't over, I don't overthink when I draw. Um, and it's because imp improvisation is something that I became much more comfortable with uh, once I took that imagination class. And so the ability to be able to just kind of improvise and think on my feet is great. Cause then, you know, especially when it comes to this city that's of my own, um, I'm, I'm never really wrong. So, you know, I just come up with something on the fly and it's, it's what it is. Yeah, you're never really wrong, but how right are you in terms of being an urban critic and an urban planner? And, and by that question, what I mean is I see lots of your Instagram posts and it looks like you walk around the city and you look at all kinds of buildings in Philadelphia and you make comments about this is a neat building, this is a good building, I don't like things about this particular building. So you are looking um, at the architectural life of Philadelphia, and I wonder how that architectural life in Philadelphia gets translated or gets in or influences you in terms of what comes out in Blandini. Yeah, I mean, it's, it is influential because I think, especially when I think about the building materials that I like to use, um, mm -hmm. I think about I think about a lot of the materials that I see in Philadelphia, and I think the el some of the elements that I put into the buildings are based off of something that I may have seen at some point that is locked in my subconscious that is coming out when I draw it. Yeah, um, and it's never going to be exactly like what I saw, but my subconscious may not have been able to put it on the paper um, without me having s seen it. As you go through the city and you see things, are you taking notes? I mean, I'll take pictures, I'll take mental notes of things, uh -huh. but you know, you, you know, you can never remember it that well. Like when you, uh -huh. you know, I'm not, I'm never going to task myself to remembering something that I saw without taking, if I, if maybe I can take a picture of it and then I can reference it. Uh -huh. I have been doing that more. Um, but, um, but the thing is that it's okay if it's never the exact detail, it's, you know, my interpretation of the detail later on still might be something cool. Yeah. So I think there's the physical details of the buildings and then there's the personalities of the buildings and both are fascinating to me. And I wanted to ask you a little bit about uh, personalities of, of buildings and personalities of neighborhoods. I was looking at, by, by the way, behind us is um, three four foot by eight foot walls full of Mason's drawings of Blendini. So 
hopefully you'll be able to come to the Neon Museum and you'll see this exhibit. So we're just scratching the surface. Oh yeah, there are 40 of them up here. <laughs> there are 40 of these buildings. So uh, one that was interesting to me was uh, Myers Brigantine. Mm -hmm. Maybe you could talk about that one. Yeah, so I don't, that's I don't a bad have personality. Yeah, I don't have Myers Brigantine with me right. um, here, but um, yeah, but I mean, tell people what oh, Myers yeah. Brigantine is. Well, specifically, I mean, Myers Brigantine is the merging of the Myers Briggs test and then Brigantine, New Jersey, <laughs> put together. Okay, and the Myers Briggs form. test is a person for people who don't know, it, it is what? Yeah, I mean, it's a personality yeah. test, and you know, you. And specifically, your your results are coded in a way to say what your personality is. Like, exactly. You know. Yeah. Um, and so there, in that neighborhood, you can see, um, while in Blandini, all the buildings have personalities. These buildings are wearing them like a badge. They're like all the like you have in Myers Briggs. Yeah, because uh -huh. so there are sixteen different uh, results for the Myers Briggs test. And right. So. Um, 16 of the buildings uh, in that neighborhood um, actually have like there's like an ENFJ building, uh, uh -huh. an ENFP building, INTP building, right. and each of the buildings their function is resulted of what. So there's this uh, website called 16 Personalities, which is sure. which is elevated the concept of the Myers Briggs test to kind of give you more of a sense of like who it is that you are right like, what does this mean and you're creating and, buildings yeah the building so i looked at 16 personalities and like i made these buildings based off of um the personality types like if, if you're okay. a specific personality type what might you do um as maybe an occupation or just like who you are so um if you look at that neighborhood you'll yeah. see and so um like i know there's a building called intp builders for uh -huh. example and they you know build all kinds of yeah. stuff for the neighborhoods. Okay, so so let's go through a, a few more buildings just to, at random. I, I, I was noticing um, Factory Village yeah. was, was an interesting one. Could you say something about that? Yeah, so Factory Village is the idea that, so, you know, when you think about an old industrial neighborhood, you know, they might, there might be a lot of jobs, but either, it's not a pleasant place to live. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, so, Factory Village is full of light industrial jobs. So it's the type of industry that doesn't um, make the neighborhood an unpleasant place to live, yet it can be still mixed with different uh, houses and, the, and, and other businesses. And so the idea is that Factory Village is really, it's like own kind of self-sustaining, but um, neighborhood that's full of light in, industrial jobs. So, uh -huh. you know, if you live there, that's, uh, you know, that's kind of what you're doing. And, and then there's also, there's a, a building that you on the, in that neighborhood that you can see called the Milgram Light Industry Collective. And those are, if you really have like more of a prototype or a small business that could eventually scale up more, you'd start out at a place like the Milgram uh, Light Industry Collective um, where you can kind of grow your business. It's kind of like a, you know, a startup incubator. Uh -huh. So th is there a message then in a uh, factory village kind of neighborhood for how you see cities yeah. potentially evolving? So I think uh, one thing that um, our country uh, specifically has gone way too far with is the segregation of, of uses. So um, from commercial to, uh, to going to work to living in your house. And you, know, you gotta drive everywhere because, I mean, it's not just because the the the, the suburbs are set up for sprawl and you know having to drive everywhere um, but it's just this uh, it's just this you even see this in 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 cities now too where you got to go far for your work because your work is not going to be by your home and your your you know the play, things to do are not nearby the work and so the the factory village is the idea of uh, bringing more mixed uses together uh -huh. um, in a single neighborhood. Which is interesting, it makes me think of Kensington in Philadelphia where there were so many mills and factories and the workers lived right in those neighborhoods. Oh yeah, typically. it used to be like that. And yeah. then the zoning codes like um, were a reaction to the unpleasantries of like like living you know, next to a factory. Because right. you know, they right. could be very noisy and polluty and all that. But you know, I think, 
something that happens with a lot of things is that they start off with they start off with good intentions yeah. and then um, they morph into something else over time. And okay. so that's that's kind of so zoning codes are something where you know there there's a lot of different reasons why zoning codes were started, um, and that's just one of them. And it's something that the zone zoning has just become such a ridiculous thing um, over time. Um, and so I'm kind of, uh, you know, bringing that back to yeah. um, what it was before, but yeah. maybe better. Well, you know, it's clear as we talk that we could spend a lot of time talking about cities and urban planning, and we could also spend a lot of time talking about your specific drawings. So I feel that we have a limited amount of time and we need to just keep popping back and forth. Oh, you know, yeah. we, we haven't been looking uh, at yeah, images so for a little bit. So why don't yeah, we pick, uh, pick out another neighborhood that you'd like to tell us a bit. Yeah, about. let's do it. So um, I am going to talk about, so this is the Ray Bradbury Cathedral of Learning. So we can mm -hmm. talk about some of the more like educational institutions um, in the in the city. And, you know, people that follow me or friends with me uh -huh. know that- I'm I gonna have, hold this up as you talk. <laughs> yeah, I have uh, mixed thoughts on the monopoly of college education and, you know, the, the educational system, the whole educational system um, as we have it. Um, and, you know, Ray Bradbury specifically is a, um, a real literary hero of mine who did a lot of extraordinary things for literature, but also his community. And he also um, uh, was a big proponent of the library and how the library and reading in general is such an important resource for kids and adults alike that um, has been declining in its uh, importance to people a bit. And mm -hmm. The Cathedral of Reading is not just a library, because um, if it's just a library, you're not going to get people that, um, you know, that could fall in love with reading, but don't know that they could fall in love with reading yet. So the Cathedral of Learning is a place, it's not just for finding books, it's also um, learning how to love to read and what your path is there. And it's yeah. also, it contains, also contains the community facilities to um, bring people together. So you can see in this one specifically, there's a cafe in the, in the library, um, as well as like a courtyard to sit in. And then there's also like other community facilities in it. So you know, people can bring talk and dialogue with each other. Yeah. So wh what's clear to me though, is that if you look at one of these drawings, you can take it in and get a certain impact from it visually, but without the explanation, without the knowledge of what you're going for here, what, what you're talking about as a futurist that is, and as an urban planner, you're only getting a piece of it, yep. you're getting part of it. And how do you want to convey both sides you know, to, um, to, to your public, to people who buy your art? Do they get an explanation of the art? Yeah. So, so what I've been, what I've been doing more and more is like, actually pair, like if I send somebody a print, they'll get an explanation as to what it is. I mean, they, they mm -hmm. typically, if they're buying it, they already know it because um, I always include the explanations on my Instagram or my website. So my website, blundinimayor.com is a, is a big uh, resource for, um, I've written a lot about each place. Yeah. And so um, so that's definitely a start. And I think the other thing too is to just um, include any visual clues if possible, at least to tell you like the business that it is or, um, you know, then, and you know, the other thing too is that I think about it where if you're looking at it and you don't know what is going on, um, it's also possible to just make up your own idea of what's going on. So if I gave this yeah. to you and you had no clue of what was happening in it, you could look at it and probably just come up with your own ideas as to what's going on and, you know, make up your own story with it. Like that's, that's what I used to do as a kid. I used to like getting these, um, they were in the above series, which was a, a series of books where a guy um, flew his helicopter over cities and took photographs. And I used to like to, honestly, I used to like to look at those cities and enjoy and think of them as my own cities and create my own stories, even though I knew I was looking at maybe Miami or Chicago. Sure. 
Um, well, so it, yeah, that's another thing. It's a burden on the artist, though, in a, in a sense, because no one's really asking an artist to um, to explain their work. I mean, typically people could look could look at a piece of art and they might say it's beautiful or it engenders various emotions. So in your case, um, to me, it's an extra added attraction to get um, the, the explanations and to understand what you're thinking about. But certainly they're projective tests. You know, they're, you, you can look at these things and you can come up with your own ideas as you're saying. Yeah. Um, or you could just like them simply as visual statements. Uh, they're fascinating. I mean, some of the elements for me, for instance, is the way you do trees, the way you do eyes. The, you know, could you say a little bit about the um, the visual elements? Oh yeah. Um, so let's in um, terms of what you like to draw and how you like to draw it and what colors you use. Th those sorts. Of yeah. Things. Let's get out the. Uh, so this is the. Actually, this is the latest uh, Blendini land grab, which I'll uh, I'll get into land grabs. Yeah, I do want bit. you to talk about land grabs. But too. Um, but for now, you can at least see the visual elements like the, the mountains and, and the trees and the grass and um, all, everything that surrounds the buildings. And so, first of all, yeah. what I do is keep this in front of I you. draw the buildings first. So I don't do I don't do any of so if there is a tree that's if there is a tree that's going to be in front of a building, then I have to plan that. But if there's a tree, for example, that can only be seen like um, outside of like the buildings and they're not in front, yeah. then that's all stuff that I do um, after I do the buildings. Cause then I can get a sense of like what I want the scale of the trees to be. Um, but you know, trees specifically, um, if you look at my first uh, drawing ever of, of Blondini, which is called the hat district, mm -hmm. um, you see that I drew trees differently. They looked like crap. I just drew like scribbles and that uh -huh. was like my interpretation of a tree. It's like how a, a little kid would do it. And for this specifically, um, I remember I was, we, I was at a friend's house and they were watching Bob Ross and he was, and I watched him for a little bit and I watched him painting a tree and he was describing painting a tree. And the way that he did it, um, I, I, I got, I went home and I just started drawing trees and they weren't like his trees because these aren't, these aren't realistic trees. Mm -hmm. um, but just watching him and seeing how it could be done, um, I ended up uh, just doing this. And so, um, and then the other thing too, is that um, over time, um, it's this whole process has made me observe more trees in real life. I mean, especially during the winter as mm -hmm. the trees have lost their leaves, this really made me look at all the different branches and the trunks and the, all that. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, that's a, you know, that's another, that's another thing. I think with trees specifically, um, what's most important, I think, is that folks um, know that what it is, is that I'm looking um, that they're looking at a tree. Yeah. Uh, it can another look like anything. element that is quite striking is the colors. Um, you would call these fauve colors traditionally. They're, Ooh, they're, fauve. Do you I've know never, the word fauve? I do not know the okay. word fauve. <laughs> well, uh, I, I won't define that, but le let me just um, ask you how you come up with your color palette. Why so many extremely bright colors in the front and it looks like more pastels in the back? So something, uh, I mean, something with this specifically, um, and it's the case with the other uh, Blondini land grab. So mm -hmm. in my drawings that I do on my own, I have, I try to use a more unifying color palette um, because when you, when you have something like this, there's just, there's a lot going on here specifically what I've, it's deliberate where the buildings are because like, I didn't want to have like, I didn't want to have like an orange building behind this building, for example. Uh, um, I wanted to kind of put everything where there's some kind of balance where you have like an orange dominant here and like an orange dominant here. Mm -hmm. um, but since these are landowners that purchased land and want to build something of their own, um, they have very specific tastes and asks for their color palette. So I'm really working off of more here of like what uh, what people want specifically. So if I was doing it on my own, 
I would probably even use less colors than here. Well, um, and just have like a range that I'm using throughout the drawing. So the colors are, and the images are influenced by the purchaser of the land. If I understand it. Yes. So, so for the land, land grab, grab. Yeah. So for the Blundini land grab. And so I actually, I brought one of my flyers that I have here. Uh, this is the third Blundini land grab flight priced at $73 per plot, eight plots available. And this actually sold out within uh, an hour and a half. Um, I'm always delighted when people want to purchase and land. What are you offering when they're buying a plot? So I will, um, I'll give them a call. We'll, we'll talk about, you know, the, I, I say, congratulations, you've purchased the plot of Blundini land. What would you like to plop on it? And um, at that point, um, we work together where I'll offer guidance if they need it. Some people come with their own very specific ideas from the get-go. And then other people will actually talk over the phone and they'll realize something that they didn't before by through talking to me. Um, one of the questions that I ask is just what colors do they like? And you know, what kind of palette would they like in particular? And you know, some of these have colors that people didn't necessarily ask. So I'll always like use what people ask for the dominant colors, the primary colors, and then um, add some like flourishes to it um, that that go with the uh, with the dominant colors. So and then we'll talk about what like use would um, would they want. So and then so everybody really has an idea for a type of business that they would want to have. They also have ideas of types of architecture that they like. Um, you know, specifically, I'm going to show you a building on um, on the very left hand side, um, right over here. Uh, that building specifically, the landowner, uh, the one that says Rifts City on it, the the landowner um, loves these two buildings in London uh, called the Gherkin that looks like a pickle uh, made out of glass. And then the other, it looks like a walkie talkie man out of glass. So it's named the, the walkie talkie. And then uh, he loves oranges and reds and stuff like that. So I mixed, I mixed those two buildings together to create um, the Rift City building, which is both a uh, library and a mental health clinic. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, on the very right, on the very bottom right, you can see Bailey Spot, which is an animal shelter and animal bakery. And the landowner specifically here uh, had, had said she really likes the, um, um, the old uh, W, uh, I think it's the WCAU building in, on Chestnut uh -huh. Street. Yeah. It's a gorgeous Art Deco uh, building that has the Old Navy in it now. Um, and uh, she loves that building, but she also loves oranges and greens and reds. So um, I basically just turned that building, um, added my own stuff to it. And then, so that was something that was very specific, but then, and then uh, on the very left here, on the bottom left, you can see the hose and ladder, which is another landowner who uh, he, uh, he specifically was looking for something that was a mix between Jack's Firehouse and Fergie's. Uh -huh. So, yeah, some people Two have specific. And yeah, so, and then some people are just like, I really like Victorian architecture, uh -huh. so they'll I'll draw that. Right. Um, or Wildwood Duop. Yeah, you know, you're raising an interesting point because um, your audience is in effect dictating some of your work, and yet they're not. In in a way, these are almost portraits because. Someone in a portrait, someone would literally sit down and you would and you would paint them yeah. through your own eyes. Here they're giving you ideas of what they would like to see, but these things are clearly Glendini. They're not someone else's notion of uh, an area that's got a library in it. Yeah. It's, it's your your notion. So how do you feel about that taking in ideas from other people and integrating them with your own concepts. I love it because the um, the city. I mean, the city specifically is a place that is an agglomeration of many many people, and so 
the, the, you can never just have a, a real city if it's just me that's like coming up with this stuff. Uh -huh. um, it'd be pretty authoritarian anyway if I was doing that. But yeah. um, the uh, but here what's in, what's great is that people have all of these cool individual ideas. You can see just how mixed use and vibrant a neighborhood is when you when you rather than when you have one person that owns the whole neighborhood, uh -huh. you have like many different parties that own the neighborhood but the common thread that they have um, is their immense respect for the city of Blondini as well as the respect for the work that I do uh -huh. so um, so people are they come in with specifics or they come in with ideas where they have a sort of abstract idea of what they want and they want me to help them bring it to life yeah and so um, in that case, uh, you know, I feel like I'm working on my own building, but this time it's like something where I've been inspired by somebody else. Yes. Um, and uh -huh. so I think it's, it's cool, but I also, but sometimes I miss doing the neighborhoods just completely on my own because right. then I can do, I have complete, I have no constraints. Right. And that's, yeah. that's fun too. So I can never do just the land grabs because yeah. then I would lose the opportunity to take creative liberties in my own place, yeah. in my own neighborhood. So we, these are all very interesting points you bring up and we only have a few more minutes. So I think what that's leading to is looking at what's the future of Glendini. And there are several parts to that question. When I, when I think about the future, uh, you're integrating other people into Blendini to some extent, but yet you're the mayor of Blendini. Might there be additional people involved in creating Blendini, or is it always going to be your creation? And in addition, do you see other directions that you may go as an artist instead of doing two-dimensional things, for instance? Yeah. Might, you, might you be going in, in other directions? Might you become a sculptor? Who, who knows? Yeah. I mean, do you, what are your a, thoughts about where, where you're going and where Blandini is going? That's a great, it's a great question. I think that Blandini is uh, something that I've realized is um, many, is going to be several different, expressed in several different mediums. Mm -hmm. And the, um, and drawing really is the, the, is the first, is the first medium. Um, but there's, there's other stuff that's going to be in the pipeline too. I mean, uh, my partner Olivia is, do, does ceramics and she, for my birthday, she created a 3D uh, clay model of one of my buildings. So to see it in 3D is just, a, ooh, it's, it's, it's like when video games went from 2D to 3D, yeah. mind blowing. And, um, and then there's also the fact that, um, yeah, animation is something that really, uh, really warms my heart and the like the ability to actually tell more stories about these buildings and like to bring them to life where they like you can hear their voices and that kind of stuff. To add sound. Yeah, I'd love I'd love to do some animation and actually add sounds and, and, and that motion, kind of motion, thing. motion and uh -huh. all that good stuff. And so right. um, that's another possibility. I um, a book is certainly another possibility where I can I can talk about uh, how the city of Blondini works, but also my like people can read it and they they can they can learn about Blondini, but they can also perhaps learn concepts of city planning that they didn't know before. Yeah. Um, so that's an, that's another that's another avenue. Um, I'd love. I was just thinking today it would be cool to like have make toys where mm -hmm. where kids can like build their own uh, Blondini buildings. Um, there's just, you know, there's a, there's such a vast treasure trove of potential mediums. And yeah. so um, I think I've actually, I've gotten itchier when it comes to expressing um, Blondini and new ideas. Um, it's not that I'm getting bored of the drawing. I love the drawing mm -hmm. um, and I, I'll, I'll be drawing for the rest of my life, but, um, but I am getting the itch to, um, explore new mediums and tell, find new ways to tell the story. And I, and I wonder also how much of an itch you have for being an urban planner. I know that you go to um, SEPTA board meetings, you, you participate in the city, yeah. and those you would call, generally you'd call those non-artistic pursuits. 
uh, if you if you're looking at the demolition of a building, uh, if you're looking at putting a new high speed line in a, in a part of the city, those are things that concern you and you seem to have uh, opinions about and I wonder if you have ever considered um, getting into the public sector in a very concrete way, not in just an artistic way, but um, but in an activist kind of a way or a participatory way. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely think about that kind of stuff. So um, I think right now where where I am is, you know, at least, you know, being an advocate for things like historic preservation and transit, what I've learned is that so something that happens a lot in in cities in general is this uh, committee paralysis that happens where in planning paralysis, mm -hmm. where there are plenty of plans that are being made that sit on the shelf there. There are plenty of uh, things that should happen that sit on the shelf. And so I think something that has like been firing up in me is taking the plans that have been made um, by city officials and marketing those plans because it, the marketing hasn't been good in the past. And the more people you can bring on board with plans, um, the better it is. And the idea that a plan gets passed on from uh, generation to generation um, to get implemented. So yeah. um, I think that that's, that's definitely something where, um, I don't know what the role would look like. You know, working for, working for uh, government in, in general, um, it's a very slow process and it's not, um, it's great where it's great having my own city because things can just, you know, kind of work the way that I want you as, have opposed, control, yeah. as opposed to having like talk, shouting at a brick wall yep. um, all the time. I mean, but that being said, um, I don't know. I mean, I, I think that uh, maybe in the future, I, I've thought about maybe running for city council in the future, uh -huh. um, but that would be, that would be well down the line. Uh -huh. I think something that I believe that all politicians should have is a real job before they become a politician. Yeah. And, you know, you don't, you don't have many of those. And people. your real job is mayor of Lindy. Exactly. Yeah. So I think we're about out of time. Uh, we've got an hour for the Zoom and I apologize again that we had to start late and we've had some technical difficulties. Um, we're in, we're in a difficult world right now, thanks to uh, th thanks to the virus and having to use these other technologies. But they're they're a mixed blessing, you know. They allow us to bring in people from all over the world, but they don't allow us for face to face yeah. uh, conversation and interaction. So we did the best that we could. We will have more um, art and history presentations in the museum in the future. And we're hoping to open the museum up for small group um, visits so that you can come in and look at Mason's Blendini environment here, where you could see all 40 of the drawings. You could read the captions about them and you can enjoy this self-created world and decide what is Mason? Is he a futurist? Is he a self-taught urban planner? Is he a self-taught artist? He defies categorization, I think. So I want to thank you again for uh, for for being our first and per perhaps our most provocative um, artist yeah. in, in our coming series of uh, of art talks. Yeah, and I thank you, Len, too, because you know it's um, it's great to. This is really my first place that I've been able to display the whole scale yeah. of Blondini and. Mm -hmm. You know the scale of it all is very important too. So, I'm. I mean, I'm very excited to have uh, small groups come in here because sure. yeah. um, I'm going to have a hell of a time talking about this place. And so, yeah, um, yeah. I think you know, be in touch. Uh, be in touch with all both of us about that because yeah, you know, it's it's coming. It it, it is coming, and yeah. if we can work it out in terms and, of uh, COVID safety, then we will have that happen. Oh, and to be in such a spectacular setting as the Neon Museum, it's an honor. The neon gives my art uh, such a lovely glow to it. Yeah, and I think they complement each other. Thanks very much. Uh, okay. Thanks, Len. And thank all of you for joining us tonight. Yeah, thank you very much, everyone.